Good Wednesday evening, folks. Chief Meteorologist Tim Pandagis here with you. Today is the 25th of September, 2024. And as you can see from the headline there, Helene has now become a hurricane, our fifth hurricane of the season. When you think about it, we've only had eight named storms. Five of them have become hurricanes, and Helene will likely be a major hurricane before landfall about 24 hours out from now. So as we talked yesterday, there was one disruptor that was a possibility to kind of uh, inhibit its intensification process, and that was some land interaction with the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula near Cancun Cozumel. While it did bring impacts to those areas, it did not, the core did not move over land, so it's just stayed over open warm water, meaning it hasn't really lost any intensity heading into the Gulf of Mexico. So no land interaction. It will now likely rapidly intensify heading up to landfall tomorrow. The National Hurricane Center intensity estimates have increased. You'll see the track in just a second, but it's now forecast to become a cap four ahead of landfall tomorrow. And we're looking at historic storm surge and widespread impacts to not just Florida, the landfall location, but into Georgia and the Carolinas heading into the rest of the work week. Let's summarize those updates from the Hurricane Center. We talked about this yesterday. A lot of you folks enjoyed being able to learn about this. So here it is again. Tropical Cyclone Advisory Schedule from the Hurricane Center comes out eight times a day. We get four intermediate updates and four full advisories, and those are the changes of the cone. So we had that at 5 o'clock. That's the cone I'll be showing you here in just a little bit. We'll get an update to that at 11 o'clock, but we'll be going off of stats from the 8 p.m. intermediate advisory that just came out a short while ago. And as I mentioned yesterday, as we get closer to landfall, Hurricane Center tends to start issuing hourly updates to give folks a little bit more of a heads up on what's going on and any changes in intensity up to landfall. So here's a look at satellite imagery. Again, we're visiting the infrared imagery to give us a feel for the intensity of the thunderstorm activity. Colder cloud tops, stronger thunderstorms, colder cloud tops depicted by the whites and the blacks that we're seeing here in the reds. Colder uh, cloud tops here on the southern side of the core right now wrapping around. You can kind of see in the last few images that it's, it's almost sputtering just a little bit. Now, I do think that this is probably because we had a little bit of some dry air that was ingested into the core, uh, briefly kind of stunting any intensification because the last two advisories have been the same as a Category 1 with 85 mile per hour winds. As you can see now from the recent image on the water vapor here, by the way, water vapor, this is the moist atmosphere, mid-levels of the atmosphere here, dry air is depicted by the rust color. So we had a little bit of dry air coming into the center there. That is now mixed out. So that's really the only thing that was going to slow it down because we've got a loop current here. This is a flow of very warm water coming up from the northwestern Caribbean here. And you can see it goes down through a very big depth. Warm water here, and this is likely going to be conducive for rapid intensification. You can see the forecast track here, kind of a foreshadowing what I'll show you in a second. Cat 1 now, jump to Cat 2 tonight, Cat 4 by tomorrow afternoon. So big time intensification likely on the way. Here is the forecast track. Again, this is the five o'clock track with the 8 p.m. advisory stats here. We're seeing gusts already to 105. Moving now due north, pressure has been coming down. Last update, we were at 979. We've dropped five millibars since then. So it is deepening and we'll likely see the winds follow suit and increase with the next update at 11 o'clock. So overnight tonight, we're up to a cat two. 110 mile per hour winds. We jump ahead 12 hours and we jump two categories up to a category four, 130 mile per hour max winds. That right now is the peak intensity from the Hurricane Center. But between 2 p.m. and say 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night, so 10 hours still over open water, uh, we'll leave the possibility open that it gets even stronger right up to landfall unless it undergoes something called an eyewall replacement cycle, something that's typical and very strong hurricanes. It's when the eye kind of collapses in on itself, briefly weakens or plateaus, and then a bigger eyewall builds in to replace it and leads to a period of strengthening. So that could be good if it happens right before landfall, briefly weakening it before it moves over land. But if it happens further out, could lead to a burst of intensification right up to landfall. So that's not really a big disruptor here. We're looking at a major impact event uh, for portions of the peninsula. In fact, a good chunk of the peninsula of Florida, or Panhandle, excuse me, I should say, and getting right up into South Georgia, too. You are not out of the woods here. You will see direct impacts from a hurricane still by Friday morning, pre-dawn, we're looking at a Cat 1, 80 mile per hour sustained winds. Then it builds north and kind of meanders and stalls and falls apart as it gets absorbed 
from another storm system that's just off to the west there. So here's the intensity forecast from the Hurricane Center. 85 mile per hour winds now jumping to 130 by tomorrow afternoon. So we'll go out about 24 hours. So we're looking at a jump here of 45 mile per hours, miles per hour in terms of sustained winds. The definition of rapid intensification is an increase in 35 miles per hour in a 24 hour time frame. So we will satisfy that and likely rapidly intensify and then rapidly weaken as it moves over land, as is expected. No real changes from the spaghetti plots here. Again, each line is a different computer model. They are honing on in and tightening up for a landfall likely in the Big Bend area. Direct major impacts likely to the capital of Florida, Tallahassee, as we get into late Thursday and early Friday. How does it look on the modeling? High resolution model here in house graph model. We have adjusted it a little bit to be a little farther west to be in line with the National Hurricane Center track. And you can kind of see that well-defined eye really taking shape ahead of landfall. And it brings it in just south of Tallahassee. And we're looking at a major storm surge event anywhere off to the east side of that center. And then it builds north. And I stopped it here at 7 a.m. on Friday. We could certainly have a scenario that we have a more intact hurricane or maybe high-end tropical storm at this point that the center passes directly over Atlanta and then builds into North Georgia and portions of Tennessee and really starts to fan out and its uh, moisture gets spread out. Now let's talk about winds. So we'll go through the impacts, the winds, the storm surge, and the rainfall, okay? Here's the winds, and here's the lobe of tropical storm force winds, the wind field, as depicted as of the 5 o'clock advisory from the Hurricane Center. 39 mile per hour winds are anywhere within this yellow bubble or this kidney bean almost. Notice how as we gain latitude, it builds to the north, the lobe grows bigger. We see the tropical storm force winds building on into Florida, southwest Florida by early tomorrow morning. And there could be a point tomorrow where a good chunk of the state of Florida is experiencing at least tropical storm force winds. The, the strongest of the winds, most intense part of the storm builds inland. We see that increasing the wind speeds up through the panhandle of Florida into south Georgia. And even in an early Friday morning, where I stopped it earlier at 7 a.m., here's what the wind field could look like. So most of central, north Georgia, western, northwestern South Carolina, and portions of Tennessee and North Carolina could easily be seeing at least tropical storm force wind gusts, which is why I really think this is going to be a big-time widespread power outage event for a good chunk of Georgia and, of course, in Florida near landfall. So now let's put some numbers on these wind speeds. So 39 miles per hour graders consider tropical storm force. We definitely have that along the west coast of Florida uh, by tomorrow afternoon. Here's the core of the system well off to the west, which is good. It's far enough that it's not going to bring uh, catastrophic impacts to central Florida, but still impacts nonetheless. And then the center of which, look at these wind speeds right up ahead of landfall, 10 p.m. tomorrow night. East Point could see wind gusts as high as 90 miles per hour. Watch what happens in the, as we go towards landfall, 11 o'clock, 124 miles per hour possible in East Point, 75 out at Perry, nearly 70 at Tallahassee. And then we could clock a wind gust of 113 possible as we get into Friday overnight, Thursday overnight into Friday as the system makes landfall near Tallahassee. Look at the wind gusts extending all the way north into South Georgia. We've got Albany 75 mile per hour winds, Valdosta around 82. Could get as high, I think that's overdone. We'll see though. 90 mile per hour winds potentially in Albany, 90 at Macon and over 45, maybe 55 miles per hour in Atlanta. Now I will say, this model is probably overdoing it after it moves inland. Land interaction, friction with the land tends to really decrease wind speeds quickly. So seeing 9, 80, 90 mile per hour wind gusts is probably pushing the limit of possibility, but it's within the realm of possibility. Okay, I will say that. Don't expect it, but expect that it could be a possibility. 70 mile per hour winds potentially out at Macon by a early morning on Friday. Now let's talk about the storm surge. Here is the median line of the National Hurricane Center's forecast track. I took off the cone, it's the median line. Anywhere to the east of the storm center, wherever it ends up making landfall, we'll see the worst of the storm surge. We call that the dirty side of the storm because not only do you factor in the winds that could be as high as 130 miles per hour, you saw sustained for a category four hurricane, but you also factor in the forward speed, which at this point in time will be accelerating. So you get even stronger wind gusts. And with this particular landfall location being just to the east of Apalachicola, and just maybe to the west of Tallahassee, we're looking here at a concave coastline.
concave coastlines increase the storm surge potential and the risk. It's a very vulnerable area for storm surge. Hurricane Center has already put out, they've been upping this, so it may go a little higher, 15 to 20 foot potential storm surge in this area as the onshore winds crank inland and pile up the water in low-lying areas. So that is going to be a major threat here. Hurricane Ian in southwest Florida, storm surge was 10 to 15 feet. You saw the damage that ha that caused. This could be even higher than that in those areas. Now let's talk rainfall potential. You know, manageable rain in a lot of parts of Florida, but there will definitely be some flooding and locally higher totals than what you're seeing here. It's really going to be an issue as you get into the uh, panhandle and most of Georgia as this tropical moisture slams into the higher terrain, North Georgia, northern and western portions of South Carolina, North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, the Appalachians here. That'll force all that moisture to rise, condense, and we see a lot of rain. 9 to 12 inches of rain here, 9 to 12 inches of rain in Macon, maybe over a half foot in Atlanta. Now, keep in mind, this is also moving pretty quick. So if this was to slow down, we'd be seeing maybe double this, these amounts. So we're not, but still an extensive flooding threat in a lot of those areas. So as you can imagine, we've got plenty of watches and warnings up. In fact, they've all been upgraded to warnings now. In the orange is tropical storm warning. Uh, in the pinks here is a hurricane warning. Check this out. The entire state of Georgia and South Carolina completely covered with active warnings at this time. I tweeted this out earlier. I don't think I can recall a time or if there even was a time when the entire states were covered. It's usually the, the coastal locations, but since we're going to see this moving inland so quickly, have such a large wind field, the tropical interactions are going to be even farther north, felt farther inland. All right, and that's not the only game in town. We've got two other areas now. Yesterday we were talking about one. Now we've got two. One 40% chance here that's out in the Atlantic that's building off to the east away from land, away from the U.S., and another one with a high odds of developing here. So the next two names on the list is Isaac and Joyce. We'll see if we get to the ninth and 10th named storms of the season in the next couple days. We'll probably have Isaac in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, so that would be two named storms out in the basin at once. We'll continue to watch it, but of course, Helene is going to be our main focus over the next 24 hours as it makes landfall Thursday night. I'll probably see you again tomorrow for another video update just ahead of landfall, but if you have questions, feel free to reach out. I don't mind answering them. Facebook, Instagram, X, and on TikTok. If you are in the path of Helene, stay safe. Heed local officials' warnings. Evacuate if ordered to do so. The storm system is going to bring major impacts, so I'll see you again tomorrow, and we'll have another update.